Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker really does not need an introduction to this audience. Dr. Roger Lear has been solely, I would say almost solely, responsible for the modern implant research, okay? Yes, abductees do get implants. Yes, Dr. Lear has removed a lot of them. And it's getting serious, guys. He is getting some absolutely extraordinary findings, and he is here to update us on them now, Dr. Roger Lear. They gave me a stool. <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be uh, back here again uh, to discuss uh, this uh, very fascinating subject with you. Uh, has everybody had lunch? Okay, well, those of you that haven't, I feel for you because I haven't either. But anyway, we have a lot of material to cover in uh, just a very short time. I'd like to make uh, one uh, special announcement. Uh, there is a trip that's going to occur. These, um, these brochures are in uh, various places at the registration table and at my table in the vendor room. It's a wonderful trip to uh, Egypt. And uh, the date is uh, May the 5th through the 17th. Uh, George Nori from uh, Coast to Coast AM. Uh, where he possibly will be there broadcasting live. So if you can make it and you want more information, uh, there's only 25 people that are going to be allowed to go. So please find out more about it. I'd like to thank uh, Bob Brown and the uh, UFO Congress for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to do this uh, presentation today. Uh, I'm going to present some, uh, some new material that... Uh, you have not uh, heard about before, and this is uh, based on the uh, 15th surgery that we've done uh, for removal of uh, alien implants. Uh, we'll simply call this uh, case file SC001-0908, and <coughs> if I can work this machine, we'll go on. Now, uh, the patient uh, has been using a pseudonym. Uh, his name is John Smith. Uh, he's 47 years old, and uh, he is married with uh, three children. Uh, he resides in uh, Southern California, and uh, his occupation just happens to be a physical scientist. So, uh, very strange things involved uh, in this case. Uh, he has a positive uh, alien abduction history, and as you know, ANS research has a very strict set of uh, protocols and criteria that we use uh, before any surgery is performed. And uh, John uh, fulfilled all the criteria and protocols and became uh, the 15th uh, case. Uh, the uh, area of concern here uh, is the uh, second toe of the left foot. Uh, we uh, had uh, x-rays uh, taken and they showed a uh, metallic foreign body uh, measuring about uh, four millimeters in length and about the thick thickness of a, a pencil lead. And as you know, in the other cases, uh, we've seen about the same thing. So we have a number of these, at least eight or nine, which all uh, look the same and uh, have uh, the same uh, essential qualities. What's unusual, uh, another thing that's unusual about this case is when we did the uh, scientific uh, study of what we have here, we find it's sort of uh, an embodiment of all the other 14 cases. If you've been following uh, my research as it's been going, if you go way, way back to the first and second cases, and we had laboratory data coming from uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories and from New Mexico Tech. If you remember, uh, they didn't know what these samples were. This was a blind study, and they came back uh, with a conclusion that these are uh, a meteorite-like, meteorite-like samples. 
And as, as you know, people don't step on meteorites or whack them with their hand, otherwise they'd have a very big hole and uh, probably not much material would be embedded in it. Uh, once the x-rays are taken, then uh, we know that there is an object there. We use a CAT scan and the CAT scan will give us the uh, approximation of uh, where the object lies and we're able to uh, then do the surgery more uh, specifically. Um, I told you it was about three to five millimeters. It's uh, radio dense. That means that it appears in an x-ray about the thickness of a pencil lead, second toe again. Uh, estimated date of insurgent, uh, insertion was uh, February the 28th of uh, 2008. And uh, how do we know that? Well, uh, the individual remembers uh, waking up in the morning and uh, he saw uh, a couple of drops of blood on the bed sheets and he looked down at the toe and there was a couple of small puncture wounds which uh, healed uh, within a very uh, short time. Uh, as with the other cases, again, there was uh, no scar and no portable of entry available. Uh, also, if you recall, uh, before we take anything out, we like to find out as much information as possible as to what's going on. And as we're able to do that and get better and better equipment, we're able to get much more knowledge. And as you recall, uh, one of the cases we did was emanating a radio frequency, which was uh, verified by uh, a friend of mine in Las Vegas, let's put it that way, who sent me a classified uh, FCC sheet. And we found out that that uh, frequency was broadcasting on a deep space radio frequency. Now, if that don't knock your socks off, I don't know what does. We have, uh, we have emissions uh, coming from this last case, uh, too. Uh, we use a Gauss meter to detect uh, the electromagnetic activity, and we found that we had a magnetic field of greater than 10 milligauss. Uh, ionizing radiation, we were only able to detect the uh, normal background uh, radiation using uh, a Geiger counter. And uh, the radio emissions, again, uh, we're at 14.749650 megahertz. Uh, I don't know yet, I haven't had enough time to, to find out exactly uh, where on the band or, or where that uh, is going, but we're finding out. Um, we had uh, emissions of RF and ELF and uh, in the microwave bands. Uh, also, uh, uh, you may have been told, but uh, we're offering everyone that uh, comes to the conference, and it's at least within the sound of my voice, if anybody's here or not in the room but are at the conference and you talk to them and you feel maybe they might have uh, an implant of something and uh, of, of whatever, uh, and uh, they would like to know more about it, we have a very expensive uh, $90,000 piece of equipment sitting right outside the door here with uh, Open Minds. Open Minds also is uh, a new entity that's coming about and it's going to uh, serve as a purpose of a clearinghouse for physical evidence and other things in the UFO field. It's going to be a marvelous organization and uh, it's headed by one uh, John Rayo. So you'll meet him out there. Anybody that wants to be scanned, uh, you don't have to undress. You can just uh, come as you are and uh, stand in front of the antenna and we'll uh, tell you what time is on your radio control watch. So that'll be right after my presentation, right outside the door in the back of the room. Um, I will go on here. The uh, surgery date was uh, September the 6th, 2008, and uh, in time, uh, looking at total time, that was uh, not long ago. Um, I was uh, used a, although it's in the foot, I used sometimes a general surgeon because my time, I find, is better spent sort of as a, as a surgical director uh, because this was uh, being filmed for a... Uh, a production that was supposed to appear on the A&E channel. So I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little divergence uh, about that. Uh, it was an excellent program and we had it in our contract that there would be no debunkers and no skeptics. 
things would be told and the scientific data uh, would be told uh, up to date of the findings. Um, they had a couple of focus groups that came in and uh, looked at the hour pilot. This was going to be a series and the series uh, was to be called Alien Intent. They looked at the series and they came up with a, a bunch of uh, real weird stuff and said they would only pick up the show if it had debunkers and skeptics in it and we said no. <laughs> I will never ever intentionally again and I, I try and do uh, the best that I can to prevent this from happening. I've done uh, numerous uh, television shows. Uh, one is uh, still playing. A lot of the shows uh, that you see on television and even those done by respectable groups uh, will bring in things. They will, uh, there's a very clever thing going on. The, the, the people who are doing the show will debunk themselves. So you may have seen some stuff that's recently on TV which have two outcomes. No conclusion or it's not real. So be very leery of what you see on TV, but I'm, I'm trying to place myself in a category <laughs> where a, if a program a, appears on TV, unless it's purely entertainment and they want me to, to entertain, uh, the knowledge that you're getting will have no debunkers and no skeptics. So uh, as on this case, I serve as a, an assistant surgeon. Uh, the anesthesia is the local. Uh, we use uh, two mixed anesthesias and just to put the area to sleep. Uh, we have uh, stills and video that record the uh, surgery going on, of which I'm going to show you some actual surgery footage. So I hope you've digested your lunch. Uh, we use assistive x-ray devices, as I've talked about before. You're going to see that in some of the slides. It's called a C-arm, and um, it has uh, a, a sender and a receiver, and then what you're seeing appears uh, at, on, a, on two television screens. You're actually able to see an instrument being uh, in, inserted, and you're able to find the object a lot quicker. Uh, we have multiple witnesses uh, who are viewing this either on TV or live, and then uh, they sign forms uh, stating that they were there. Uh, now, the specimen uh, appeared, when you looked at it as an, on an x-ray, as um, a, a solid unit. But yet, when we went to remove it, it came out in multiple fragments. It was uh, quite uh, brittle in, in nature, and it sort of came apart. And the fragments, as in the other cases, were surrounded by this very strange type of biological coating, which we've been finding with some of the other objects. Uh, the uh, fragments uh, were all placed on a surgical drape, which you will see, and I had to very carefully uh, pick these fragments up and put them in the specimen container, uh, which uh, contains the patient's own blood serum. Uh, one of the uh, photos here is a, um, the device that we use for the detection of uh, radio waves. And uh, we, we did that as well as using the Gauss meter. Uh, here you'll see some uh, filming going on. And um, also you'll recognize uh, one of the individuals there as uh, Whitley Strieber. Uh, a couple of pictures. I'm uh, pointing to uh, the object on the uh, television screens that, um, that is part of the uh, C-arm apparatus. Uh, this may be a little hard to see, uh, but there is an object uh, right here. And uh, that's the, uh, the object that we removed. Uh, here is uh, some actual uh, surgery going on. This is uh, material which uh, has uh, blood on it and a few pieces of the specimen. Here's the specimen uh, container. It uh, contains uh, blood serum and uh, has a bit of the sample on it. Now, um, we'll just diverge for a moment. What we like to do is we uh, like to check as many things as possible. And this case was so interesting, I couldn't help but want to present you this material, which is the first time anybody is ever uh, hearing this. The, uh, 
you're going to get a lot of information which you've never heard before. This is the first time a breakthrough. So uh, I, I just I hope you realize how lucky you are to uh, be a, a part of this. A client's home is a single-story dwelling. Its uh, exterior uh, construction is a plaster over a ch chicken wire and uh, and uh, uh, the you know usual type of wrap wrapping. The interior is uh, plaster over wallboard. Uh, there, it, there's a number of uh, magnetic anomalies we found. The exterior of the master bedroom wall uh, above and below, but mainly below the window, showed some uh, magnetic uh, properties. A backyard soil uh, was uh, highly magnetic uh, with a large magnetic field exceeding 10 milligauss. And the soil also spontaneously catches fire. Uh, we took samples and had some soil analysis done and found that the soil has an extremely high bromine content. Uh, there, he had a, a fiberglass boat that was in the driveway and uh, the fiberglass was also highly magnetic, which uh, I don't know how that can happen. Uh, there was anomalies also of a Cadillac automobile uh, that the individual drives. The interior of the house had numerous magnetic anomalies. All the utensils in the kitchen drawers, including things that absolutely should not be magnetic, such as, the, you know, those uh, wooden uh, salad serving uh, forks and spoons and other utensils that were either plastic or uh, made of wood. They are not supposed to be magnetic. Uh, they were the kitchen cupboard hinges were highly magnetic and some of them contained uh, only one pole of the magnet. Uh, unipoles are not supposed to exist, but uh, evidently they do. Uh, the non-metallic kitchen counters also were magnetic. The interior uh, master bedroom uh, wall, uh, again around the windows and confluent areas which we found on the outside, was also magnetic. Uh, I hope you can see this. This is a drawing of the house and it indicates uh, areas of a large amount of magnetism. There was a uh, avocado tree that was growing in the backyard and we set the gauss meter on a limb of the avocado tree and it pegged the gauss meter at 10 milligauss. Now if you've ever seen <coughs> excuse me, an, a, an avocado tree that was magnetic, please get in touch with me at once. Uh, I would hate to eat the fruit off of that tree and have it stick to the metallic buttons on my shirt or something like that. Uh, have a taco. They wouldn't want to make guacamole out of that, I think. All right. Now, in addition to this, we were able to uh, dim the lights um, in the bedroom and using uh, three different frequencies of ultraviolet light, we found, again, this is the first time, so enjoy it. It's for real. Here's a picture of it. I hope you can see it. We found two small childlike handprints on the wall which were phosphorescing and they only have four fingers. I don't, I don't have any friends that have four fingers that I know of. Here's another one. Look, look carefully. We've got, uh, we've got this now. We, we took out the piece of the wall and we're going to uh, get, try and get DNA off of this. There's a new device that's been uh, invented and uh, it's a tape and you can put the tape uh, over something that you're trying to get DNA uh, and you peel the tape off and you can send this tape into a laboratory and you can get the DNA. So we're very uh, interested in seeing what the outcome. But just the photograph alone which occurs uh, in a house where abductions are be have been going on and then you find two four-fingered small handprints on the wall I think is a pretty interesting finding. Uh, 48 hours, here's another uh, weirdo, 48 hours after the surgical uh, specimen was placed in a sealed container I uh, went to check on it. All the little pieces uh, that uh, we had taken out, I told you the object break, broke into a number of fragments, all the little pieces became a darker color. And they not only became a darker color, but when you lifted up the specimen container, they began to rearrange themselves in the order of which we saw in the x-ray. Now, uh, I, I called the cameraman and we had him uh, come down and immediately take a video of that. Never seen anything like that before. 
were uh, working on possible explanations uh, why this happened. Okay, now this is going to be video, I think. I can find the cursor. I'm, there we go. There we go. This should work. There we go. Okay, get ready. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to shut up. Watch the surgery. If you feel bad, like that, you'll find a bag in the seat in front of you pocket, pull it out, you'll right know what on. to do. Yep. Okay. So, um, what I plan to do is just make a small little neck. Are you alright, guy? Okay? Yeah. Okay. And see if we can actually be lucky. Remember to take it in the bus, so I'll make sure you have a sponge. Stand. I have to explain to you that this is all unedited footage. Let's try it again. Now you'll see the camera sometimes going to the shore, and the ceiling is just constantly running. Uh, we're handheld and some of these shots are going to be running again. It's close to the good. Did it hurt you? Did it all turn on? Yeah, well, for sure. There's some sound of the ambience. That's the screen, two screens that we look at. When we were down to the last piece that appeared on the, uh, on the scanning device, we were just about ready to go and remove that piece, shut the equipment down because we weren't really looking for it. We turned it back on. That piece is no longer visible. Pinch it for a minute, it'll slow down, I'm bleeding. Where did it go? What it's happened? It's coming out of quick, so it's not. We don't have I'm a trying to do it from a different position to move this tool like it this. It was not there. Excellent. We did not remove it. See, my finger's locked. Mm -hmm. Not his toe. Everybody doing okay? Anybody need a shot of coffee? Nothing there, sir. Doesn't appear to be anything visible. Well, I, I think we've. we've uh, Let's say that again. Say that again. Take one more quick shot and take it from Okay, one more quick shot here after my last suture goes on. And, uh, if we see any, anything in there. I mean, you saw one little tiny speck. I thought we didn't get quite all of it. But I don't see anything now. No, it looks clear. I don't see anything left. I think we got it all out of there. So we're going to put a little pressure on your tongue here. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to have you, Dr. Lear, take this very carefully. Very carefully. Yeah. All these little pieces out here. You know what you're talking about? Yeah, the ones from here to there. Yeah. They're really yeah. tiny things. So I put them all right in this area. <laughs> this is a very unusual way to do this. What we did was we, we took these little pieces and placed them on the sterile drape. And then uh, you'll see me cutting a piece off of the sterile drape and then we take that into the lab and from there I very gently pick these little pieces out and put them in this uh, vial of blood serum. Dr. <laughs> hold that up to the camera and kind of tell us what's, what's contained in that. Sorry, Sorry. sir. Can you step over for me, Paul? Thank you. Yeah. Hold on a second, sir. 
And I never go yeah. into any of these trees with these, any uh, little spots here that we're looking at are uh, very small pieces of tissue. No matter how strange uh, you would appear would or metallic, you can assume uh, it to be, it could always be something rather tissue. mundane. And we've had that experience uh, we'll before uh, at the in the, the 15 case. Uh, we have. So what, where, where is this going to head up to now? Well, depending upon when I get out of here, we'll have to determine whether we have enough to send the pathology or whether it should go directly to metallurgy. So we need to get an SEM done, which will look at both the soft tissue and the metal. Can I, uh, uh, can I uh, help you sit down and go through this? I think I'm in the middle of the yard and everything. Okay, I want to get it so we can put it in that uh, vial. So that Okay, that's enough of that. Everybody see that okay? Everybody all right? I'd ask you for a show of hands, but I can't see a doggone thing up here. Okay, let's uh, go to the uh, testing. We uh, performed uh, a number of tests, and as you realize uh, what I've told you before, we've spoken, we, we look at the object and we look at the outside first, and then they, we begin to look in. So we do uh, some optical microscopy and uh, get to see what the thing looks like with some magnification. And then we do SEMs, which is a scanning electron microscopy, and EDX, which is X-ray dispersive X-rays. And that tells us uh, what the object is uh, basically made out of uh, as far as the elements are concerned. Um, these are a couple of the graphs uh, using what's called Raman spectroscopy. And uh, it begins to give us uh, clues into what we are looking at. Now, uh, analytical tests uh, showed the following. Uh, we showed uh, trace element uh, patterns which were uh, consistent with uh, meteoric origin. All the way back, remember I told you in the beginning, back to the first two cases. We're all the way back to that again. And we look at the nickel-iron ratio in these, and the nickel-iron ratio appears to fit in the meteoric category. Now, what someone has done, some entity or something, looks like they're using a meteoric iron mixed with some other rare elements to um, make uh, an object, to put together an object with a specific function. Now, um, in addition, there are a, a number of things that uh, we, we found. Um, I told you about the nickel-iron ratio. We found some minor elements in the sample. Some of them are listed here. Um, these are very strange elements to uh, find in uh, somebody's foot. Uh, you just usually don't find these uh, sort of things. Now, in addition to this, uh, we have uh, testing which shows that there's biological uh, material which is either growing out from the metal or into the metal. Uh, we don't know yet, but we're doing more uh, testing and more data. Uh, this is uh, mind-blowing enough, uh, especially uh, when you look at the last one here, which is uh, uranium and uh, the only isotope of uranium that uh, was found was uh, U-238, which is uh, very difficult uh, to find in nature existing by itself. So in, in total, uh, what we have here is something that's, uh, that's most, most unusual. Uh, this is not the end of the science, but I wanted to uh, present this material uh, to the public for the first time and uh, I chose the UFO Congress to, uh, to do this. Uh, there are going to be many more, uh, more tests that are, are going to be done. <laughs> and uh, if we can get them done in time in total, we want all the I's dotted. We want all the T's crossed. We don't there, want there to be any concern. <laughs> and <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, controls, uh, which uh, consist of... Uh, uh, perhaps a piece of steel and an actual meteorite, uh, meteorite uh, fragment, and then we'll be able to compare these and say, this is what we have, this is what's in a nickel-iron meteorite, this is what's in a piece of steel, and these, you know, apparently are not things that come from here. 
Now, there's a, 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 some other a significant th- things that we found <laughs> in the sample. Uh, there may be things like uh, inclusions. And I told you uh, before, if you've li- listened to me speak, that uh, some of the testing that was done at the University of Toronto uh, in Canada showed that there were very interesting spheres or uh, ovoids and other material that was uh, found in the samples at uh, the University of Toronto, uh, including um, in this particular sample, we, we not only found those confluent with what we found in a, uh, at the University of Toronto Material Science Department, but we've also found uh, inclusions which appear to be sodium chloride crystals that are uh, rectangular in various sizes. And you say, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, think back. Remember, uh, is there anybody here that's old enough to remember a crystal set? If you raise your hands, I'll try and see. <coughs> yeah, a few, a few people. The old, old radio was a crystal set. <coughs> and what, what did you use to get a radio program? You used the crystal, you know, and a battery, and a copper coil, and a set of earphones, and lo and behold, you got a radio show. The early days of radio. So crystals must uh, have some meaning. And perhaps that uh, meaning uh, is being used uh, by uh, entities from somewhere else or intelligences from somewhere else that know how to use the atomic structure of the elements that uh, we have here in this solar system or maybe some other solar system or maybe some other distant galaxy. Who knows? But they're able to put things together in, yes, you could say, a manufactured way, uh, as we consider uh, manufacturing. So they can put things together that can use these basic materials for a very specific purpose. And that is appeared, it appears is what's going on here, is a, is a very, very complex, <coughs> excuse me, very complex form of nanotechnology. And as you, as you know, our nanotechnological development is uh, occurring as we speak. Now, I want to make just uh, one other statement. Uh, they say I have uh, nine minutes left. There's a wonderful clock up here now. It's all a modernization. You see we have colored lights and all this modern equipment. It's just wonderful. I've lectured at these Congress proceedings now for a number of years. and. The improvements that have been made are just marvelous. So at the end, I'm going to ask for your hand for the Congress and, and uh, Bob Brown. Anyway, uh, I get asked often about disclosure. Uh, now, there's going to be a conference in Washington, D.C. that Steve Bassett's putting on called the X Conference. And in talking to Steve, he expects that disclosure uh, may even occur before the conference. I hope he's correct. But in my personal opinion, after traveling around the world in 42 countries in seven years, I can give you my opinion, and that is disclosure is happening as we speak. All you have to do is pick up the tidbits that occasionally appear on radio, on television, uh, coast to coast. You, you will get uh, some knowledge of things happening here and happening elsewhere. You go on the internet. Uh, go on the internet, use it as a tool. Uh, you may be getting some truth somewhere. Other stories are, are not the truth. But disclosure, I think, is, is happening. We've had a number of governments that are releasing information. Uh, Denmark, Canada, uh, Brazil, France, the UK. You know, why, why is this all going on? There's some predictions about Obama's meeting with the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Canada, supposedly discussing uh, other factors having to do with the economy. Some feel that uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton, who we believe is is in the know, and Leon Podesta there, that the the U.S. government uh, may actually disclose some information. And then, you know, also consider uh, what is disclosure and what are you going to do? Uh, who's going to make it? Uh, suppose the U.S. government does uh, tell you that 
that we have uh, non-terrestrial visitors and we've had for a number of years and they're flying around and invading our airspace and they can't protect you from whatever it is they do. That, that's quite a, an admission. I don't really think we're going to hear that. They may tell you about some cases, maybe. But let's say, you know, who, who are you going to believe and how it is going to affect your life? Let's say the President of the United States makes an announcement that we have extraterrestrial visitors. You're still going to get up in the morning and what are you going to do? You're going to make breakfast and for those that go to a job, you're going to go to work. And uh, as an example, if, if one came down during rush hour, a big craft from three, four light years away in our neighborhood, as my good colleague Stan Friedman talks about, and lands on the freeway system. How is that going to affect your life? Most probably you're going to get on your cell phone and you're going to call some agency like Caltrans and you say, can you get this thing moved off the freeway? Because I got to get home, I got to feed my cat, my wife expects me for dinner, <laughs> you know, I got to stop at uh, Albertsons and pick up something. Uh, but yeah, it's nice. Uh, we have visitors now from somewhere else, but please don't let them interfere because, you know, I got to get up in the morning. I got to go to work. So uh, how much uh, difference is it really going to make uh, in, in our lives? You know, and I don't think that the, the other side of the coin where you watch movies and they're going to come and eat us or, you know, they're like walking zombies and they come out and do all kinds of nasty things and come back from the dead and they bleed green and all over your carpet. <coughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think, you know, if they wanted to eat us, eh, they would have eaten us years ago. <coughs> food, food for thought. <coughs> Anyway, if you, uh, you know, if you want to help uh, with disclosure, tell a friend, tell an enemy, tell somebody. You know, they won't think you're crazy anymore. Believe me, people, kids talk about this stuff. Uh, do something. Be, uh, be active. Be proactive in the subject of getting the uh, information out. Go to my table. I have some books. I have some DVDs. Go to Stan's table, one of the other speakers. Buy, buy some of their things. If you've already read it or you've already seen the video, take it. Give, a, give something away as a birthday, Christmas, New Year's. Give it to your wife for her anniversary or something. Give, give something to somebody. Spread the word. That's the easiest way to do. Pick out a good DVD and say, here, look, here's a present for you. Take it home. Yeah, I only spent 10 bucks, but that's okay. It's a worthwhile present. Go ahead, take it home and enjoy it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk to you. And by all means, if you have children or grandchildren, listen to what they have to say. Because I think that the human race is being genetically manipulated, and I hope in the right direction. And if you listen to what kids or your grandchildren have to say, I mean really listen. It seems like they're in tune with, with a knowledge that they don't have to read out of a book. They've got it. They've got it already. And so the future of the earth is in the hands of our children. It's in the hands of our grandchildren. And so listen to what they have to say. And then make comparisons about, you know, your neighbor's young daughter. My uh, young granddaughter is uh, nine years old. And every time we go out in the car, you know, and she knows what I do. But I don't think she's very impressed. But she's always in the car. She's always looking out the window, looking at the sky. And, and she sees, you know, something like uh, an airplane from a, a peculiar uh, standpoint. And it doesn't have flashing lights on it. And she'll say... Is that a UFO? And I'll say, no, that's uh, probably Southwest coming in for a landing at LAX. And, and she's really disappointed because she wants to see a UFO. So uh, listen to what uh, kids uh, have to say in, in depth. Be amazed. You know, you, you ever, I've never had a parent or a grandparent ever tell me uh, anything uh, that I was wrong. Because if you listen to what kids have to say, you're going to be impressed. You're going to say, oh, where did they get that from? You've been watching a lot of TV. But uh-uh. It isn't on TV. And there, believe me, there are cultures still on this planet that don't have TVs. There are still people without food, without shelter in this day and age, which is 
impossible to believe. But there are people starving right here in our own country. But if you talk to any of them and they're surviving, they're gonna, the young people are going to tell you the same thing. So with the two minutes I have remaining, I'm going to finish two minutes early. And I thank you very much. If you want to come to my booth, I'll sign books. If I can answer any questions, if you want to be scanned, just go out the back door and uh, see John Rayo and the crew there. Uh, you, as I said, you don't have to undress. Uh, no embarrassment. And uh, we can even uh, tell you if you've got a cell phone on. So thank you very much. <laughs>